Welcome to the Freak Show, fellow freaks. I'm Matthew Brockmeyer. I'm Krista Carmen. I'm Jim Groves. I'm Mark. I'm not telling you my last name because it's secret. And this is... Murder Coaster. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to our special episode on the history of the werewolf film. And we are honored to have two guests with us today, Mark and Jim, from the podcast Horror Movies and Shit, to explore the evolution of lycanthropy in the world of cinema, as well as to let you know which werewolf movies are the best, which are the worst, which ones you just gotta see, and which ones you can skip. So, grab a pen and paper, and I say that with all seriousness. Get ready to take some notes, because we are going to get down and dirty with the werewolf movie today. Let's begin. What we now recognize as the contemporary portrayal of a werewolf, a creature that stands upright, bearing a more human than wolf-like appearance, cursed to undergo a monstrous transformation during the full moon, complete with the emergence of hair and fangs, and possessing an apparent vulnerability to silver bullets, is largely a product of Hollywood. During the height of the European werewolf hysteria in the 1500s, a period in which France alone saw the accusations of lycanthropy directed at approximately 30,000 individuals, the perception of the werewolf was markedly different. In that era, the werewolf was seen as a genuine wolf, moving on all fours with little to no trace of humanity left, save perhaps for a glimmer in the eyes. Contrary to the notion of an unwanted curse transmitted through a bite, these werewolves were believed to be individuals in league with the devil, actively seeking transformation through various means, such as donning magical belts, draping themselves in wolf skins, or imbibing dew collected from the paw prints of a wolf in the mud. Furthermore, werewolves were regarded as allies and associates of witches, often collaborating closely in their pursuits. And in stark contrast to the modern belief in the necessity of a silver bullet, these creatures were deemed susceptible to more traditional forms of execution, such as hanging or burning at the stake. The precise number of accused werewolves subjected to such fates in medieval Europe remains uncertain, but historical records attest to the existence of thousands of such cases. So we brought these fun guys from horror movies and shit on the show today to go over the history of the werewolf film with us, starting with the very first one, during which we'll explore the evolving mythos of the werewolf, a creature which, like its monster movie sibling, the zombie, was mostly created by horror films and is ever-evolving, unlike, say, The Vampire, which came to cinema with its own set of rules already established and hasn't strayed that far away from them since. In 1913, the first werewolf film was released, named simply The Werewolf, obviously both black and white and silent. The mythology was wide open regarding cinematic lycanthropy, and this film, the original, actually used the Native American lore of skinwalkers as its premise, shunning European witches and magical belts. But while this film is lost to time, the prints being destroyed in a fire way back in 1924, there are still photographs, and we can see that right away Hollywood was creating its own version of what the werewolf is, for we see a bipedal werewolf, a creature more human than wolf, that's even wearing clothing. This goes against both the Native American skinwalker legends and the European werewolf legends. Hollywood had created its monster. But the werewolf took a long break from movies, and it was 12 long years before another werewolf movie came out. This one, in 1925, called Wolf Blood, about conflicting lumber camps deep in the forest of the Pacific Northwest. 
Basically, a guy is given a blood transfusion using wolf's blood and becomes bestial and violent. Again, the mythology is just wide open in Hollywood. One thing this film does show is the conflict between myth and science, which is often a theme in a horror and werewolf movies. But there's a great misfit song called Wolf's Blood that may or may not be inspired by that movie. It's a little ditty that goes, And I feel my vertebrae extending, and I feel my heart expand, and I feel my muscles rip, and I feel my snout extend. Then I know I'm not a man. Ugh, you don't know what I fucking am, what I become. I, I thought that was Danzig on, on Fantastic. The, oh, wow. Ten years later, The Werewolf of London comes out in 1935, the first talkie werewolf movie, or werewolf movie of a sound. The werewolf curse comes from Tibet in this one, and the moon is introduced into the lore. Though it's not a major element. Again, we have a bipedal clothed werewolf that's more man than beast, and we can see how Hollywood had such a grip on the werewolf mythos. For Jack Pierce, who did the makeup, wanted a creature more beast than man, with thick, thick tufts of hair covering his entire face. But the actor Henry Hull wasn't having it claiming it would be a hindrance to his acting and insisted that he have no hair from the eyes down. But Pierce later used the design on Lon Chaney in the iconic The, Were the Wolfman. And uh, this one's got a good song, too, by uh, Warren mm -hmm. Zevon. Anybody want to belt out a lyric of that one? Werewolves of London. Wow. <laughs> I don't think. Yeah. Has anybody seen this one? Of course. Many times. I don't think I have, actually. Oh, it's a it's a it's a it's really good. It's classic, you know. It's um, the werewolf looks scary as hell, and it's it's a great it's a great one. I highly recommend it. Uh, classic. In 1939, a period piece suspense thriller was released called "The Face at the Window," where a series of murders is attributed to a wolf man. And in 1941, comes the big one that changes the game forever. The Wolfman, starring Lon Chaney Jr., the son of the horror icon of the silent era. This movie introduced so much new mythology into the werewolf, and much of it was the invention of screenwriter Kurt Seidbeck. Kurt was Jewish and had come to America from Germany to escape the Nazis. And the Nazi occupation of Germany actually led to a lot of the mythos of the Wolfman. In the film, those with the werewolf curse had a pentagram appear on their hand, which was side max showing the real world significance of people marked for death with the sign of a star. He'd also seen men turn into monsters and kill before his very eyes. And when Larry Talbot exclaims in the film, a wolf and a star, what does that mean? Well, we don't have to wonder because Sidemeck explained it later in an interview. Quote, The swastika represents the moon. When the moon comes up, the man doesn't want to murder, but he knows he cannot escape it. The wolfman destiny. Unquote. So I, I thought that was, it's fascinating, you know, because when the moon's not up, they're just good people. But when the swastika comes into the sky, they turn into killers and animals. So Kurt Seidmack brought in the moon as being completely integral to the transformation and the idea of the werewolf curse being carried out by a bite. And he thought up silver bullets. And this, this is wild. He says he was working on the screenplay and listening to the Lone Ranger on the radio. And when they talked about the Lone Ranger having silver bullets, he's like, that sounds good. That's I love that. And he also uh, penned this wonderful poem for the film. Even a man who is pure of heart and says his prayers by night may become a wolf when the wolf bane blooms and the autumn moon is high. And of course, we have the iconic Lon Chaney Jr. in that makeup by Jack Pierce that we still see everywhere to this day. And the classic universal films that followed, like House of Frankenstein, which were just a cultural phenomenon. So, yeah, 
it's a classic, right? Absolutely. Must see. Must see. And, and one thing, I mean, you have to think about back in the time. So the Wolfman, right? So they, they, they did wonderful time-lapse um, special effects on him, right? It's, it still looks great today. But as a Wolfman, he doesn't bite anybody. He strangles people. I think that they he wasn't allowed to by the censor right. board. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think it was probably a societal thing back then where you probably couldn't show blood. But yeah, I think it's kind of interesting. <laughs> it is. There was so many things. If you had two people in a bed, one of them always had to have their foot on the ground. And you couldn't <laughs> show a toilet. So many things. Well, famously, Psycho was the uh, first movie showing a flushing toilet. I was about to mention that. Yeah. Great minds think alike. Yeah. He, oh, he, crazy. Hitchcock broke a lot of the rules. <laughs> he did. And can we also mention, too, that this is the first movie where the the person that is is experiencing the change has something that they cannot control thrust upon them. Yes. Like this, it, it now becomes almost a metaphor for different changes in, in life. Absolutely. Um, a year later, in 1942, the mad monster comes out. This one harkens back to wolf's blood in that a blood transfusion is given uh, using the blood of a wolf. But far from uh, being done to save a man's life, this is done by a mad scientist to change his gardener into a werewolf in order to prove his scientific theories and exact revenge. Uh, also in 1942, The Undying Monster. Uh, this is one uh, that's more of a mi mystery thriller than a straight horror movie, but it's very uh, atmospheric um, in its lycanthropy. Um, it's a family curse passed down generation to generation, a thing we'll see again and again. And in 1943, Universal is back at it with Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman. This one is a true classic bringing back Lon Chaney Jr. for his iconic werewolf. Originally, Chaney was to play both the werewolf and Frankenstein's monster, but it proved to be too much, so they brought in Bela Lugosi to play the monster. It's a great, great movie. You can put it on for background music on Halloween. Return of the Vampire in 1943 was meant to be an unofficial sequel to Dracula with Bela Lugosi back as the vampire, and with it comes the old myth of a vampire being able to transform into a wolf. Cry of the Werewolf in 1944 was another of the lycanthropy is carried down through the family stories. Joe Dante, director of The Howling, included this one in his list of the worst horror films of all time. So enough said there. And in 1944, Universal cements its rule of the werewolf with House of Frankenstein, originally titled The Devil's Brood. Another absolute classic with uh, Glenn Strange coming in as a monster. It was hugely popular and soon followed by the sequel, House of Dracula, in 1945. 1946 gave us She-Wolf of London, another thriller mystery where lycanthropy is carried down through generations of a family, very similar to The Undying Monster. And in 1948 came Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. And this was my dear father's favorite movie. I watched it countless times with him as a child. It's Incidentally, it was also Jerry Garcia of The Grateful Dead's favorite movie as well. An absolute classic, a must-see. I mean, obviously, it's funny. It's really hilarious. But it's also incredibly atmospheric. Amazing special effects. And, you know, by this time, they had those special effects down to a science. I consider it the cherry on the golden age of the universal Wolfman. The werewolf movie craze of the 1940s faded in the 50s as science fiction films began to take over horror. And the werewolf in 1956 was a mix of both science fiction and lycanthropy. Scientists unwittingly create a werewolf with a serum they've made in a lab. There's a pretty badass looking wolfman running around in a suit and tie. Tons of drool dripping off its fangs. If you want some iconic 50s sci-fi in your werewolf, check it out. Yep, absolutely. And in 1957, I Was a Teenage Werewolf, a Michael Landon classic, um, comes out. And this is the first movie where we actually see uh, lycanthropy being used as a metaphor almost for puberty. Because you actually start seeing a young man who is going through a forced change 
um, and having to deal with all of his baser instincts. So um, there is the iconic Leatherman jacket, and that was revived by John Landis in his Thriller video. And uh, the Cramp song is legendary. Anybody want to sing with me? Mark, that's on you, buddy. Uh, you did such a good job before, um, Matthew. Uh, you can do it again. I <laughs> was a teenage werewolf. Braces on my fangs. I was a teenage werewolf. No one even said thanks. <laughs> bravo, bravo. <laughs> Thank you. The Daughter of Dr. Jekyll was released in 1957. In it, a woman discovers she is the daughter of Dr. Jekyll and turns into a werewolf. And in 1958, how to Make a Monster came out. The first color werewolf movie. Well, kind of. It switches the color at the very end for a big fire scene. And this one was a new turn on the werewolf mythos. In this one, a master monster makeup artist uses hypnotism on an actor in werewolf makeup to make him go wild and exact revenge on the movie studio that fired him. Pretty cool, clever idea, and very, very meta. And then 1960, House of Terror came out. Um, it's a Mexican film, but they did get the uh, old Long Cheney Jr. Um, to come south of the border and play the Wolfman once again. Um, it's really weird. Uh, a guy in the Wax Museum is trying to reanimate the dead by injecting them with blood and resurrects an Egyptian mummy that is also a werewolf. Very interesting. And Hammer finally jumps into the werewolf game in 1961 with The Curse of the Werewolf. Oddly enough, though, this would be the only werewolf movie Hammer Studios made. In this classic, The Curse of Lycanthropy is bestowed by being born on Christmas Day. Remember we talked about that, Krista, that myth? Uh, yes. Our werewolf? Yes, yes. From Scandinavian mythology. Very, very strange. I like it, though. And the Italian film Werewolf in a Girl's Dormitory comes out in 1961. At a girls' school, several students are murdered by a snarling wolfman-like creature. 1964 saw a face of the screaming werewolf. 1964 saw a face of the screaming werewolf. This one was actually made by combining footage from two unrelated Mexican horror movies. And there's a rumor that some shots of the monster were filmed by Ed Wood. That's pretty cool. And uh, in 1965 in Britain, Dr. Terror's House of Horrors was released. Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee star in this classic. And this is one of the first of several. Uh, and, and it's a thing we see today too: the anthology horror movie where you have several short stories all told in one. You know, others that follow by the same production company were The House That Dripped Blood and Tales from the Crypt. So each of these stories is basically a tarot card dealt out on a train. And the first one is a werewolf story. In it, uh, werewolfism is a curse. And uh, they make silver bullets, but sadly, they do not work on this werewolf in the film. But, uh, you know, Peter Cushing, Christopher Lee, can't go wrong. Check it out. Absolutely not. <laughs> and now we're on to true and utter exploitation. At its finest. Jim, I know you love your explo uh, exploitation movies. <laughs> uh, so we have, so we have uh, 1965's Swinging Orgy of the Dead. Um, the legendary Ed Wood, once again, uh, wrote the screenplay to this erotic horror film. Um, there's a werewolf and a mummy and lots of tits and ass. So if that's your thing, Jim, check it out. Lots of bare breasts in this one. Oh, that really sounds is. so titillating. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's classic. In a graveyard, too. It's it's, it's good yeah. stuff. It's like that. Um, Remember the teaserama movies like Betty Page and yeah. shit? It's like just like that. Yeah. Well, you guys can enjoy those. <laughs> <laughs> the She-Wolf was released in 1965, another Mexican film. It's said to be quite good, very atmospheric, with great special effects, very gothic. If 60s gothic Mexican films are your jam, give it a try. House of the Black Death hit theaters in 1965 as well. Lon Chaney Jr. is back, and a hardcore Satan worshiper in this fun one. 
Lots of good old fashioned devil worshiping. Great background for horror parties. It, it really is like put it on in the back. A lot of these are just great to put it on the background of a horror of a horror party. And I, I love this fucking movie. It's got a lot of satanic belly dancing. I mean, it's not like the Ed Wood one where they're actually showing naked people, but I mean, there's some hot Satan worshiping belly dancing going on and, and like awesome black masses. But so I, I have age, a, yeah, I have a question for you, Matthew. How do you know it's satanic belly dancing? Oh, he's, they, they say it straight up. He's like, I love Satan. Satan is my master. My master. There's Satan worshipers. Oh, which no, no, I guess I'm not, I'm not, goes, I'm not goes, debating that. I'm saying, how do you know that the belly dancing is satanic? Well, she's banned. It, it, it's semantic, in a satan, In a satanic ceremony. So Those I guess I'm assuming. <laughs> Jim, 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 you know, whenever you go to church and do belly dancing, that's for Jesus. Is it? Yeah, so, well, <laughs> I, I've never been to a belly dancing church, Mark. <laughs> but Lon Chaney Jr. and he's all older now, getting a little paltry, and he's like in the the full on black cloak, and he's just like smiling and kind of very good nature, just like I love Satan. Satan's my lord and master. It'll make you want to join the Church of Satan. I- I'm gonna have to look this one up. That sounds quite enticing. It's great. <laughs> Um, and in 1968, we have um, the prolific Spanish filmmaker Paul Nashi, who jumps into the game with Mark of the Wolfman, also known as Frankenstein's Bloody Terror, for some reason, uh, even though Frankenstein isn't even in it. Uh, Nashi would go on to make 11 more werewolf movie- movies all the way up to 2003. Um, all with him in the role of the werewolf Vladimir Daninitsky. In this one, uh, we have some junk, drunken gypsies, trying to say that quickly, um, mm-hmm. accidentally awaken a werewolf that's thought dead. And Paul Nashi would usher the werewolf into the 1970s with Assignment Terror, his second werewolf movie where an alien scientist goes to Earth to exterminate the human race by unleashing vampires, werewolves, and mummies. The sleazy 70s sees the Roger Corman-produced Beast of Yellow Night, made in the Philippines in 1971. Satan saves a man from death on condition he become his disciple, which actually harkens back to true medieval werewolf beliefs. Paul Nashi is on a roll and releases The Werewolf vs. the Vampire Woman in 1971. I don't know why. I love this movie for some reason. It's very gothic, very atmospheric. Lots of like fog rolling in the hills with like a vampire woman and a werewolf creeping around. It's, it's really European, like uh, kind of reminds you of a Hammer film a lot. It's 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 fun. Great film. Check it out. I, I think that's what Nashi was going for. Definitely back then. Just that atmospheric um, Yeah. Kind of but then he ends up making porn in the end. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, also in 1971, the legendary cult classic Werewolves on Wheels. Gotta love some alliteration. Um, the classic grindhouse exploitation outlaw bikers versus satanic cult flick. Obviously, with some werewolves in. Fuck yeah, this is one of them. I love this movie. Again, more boobies, if that's your thing. <laughs> they show this. Is <laughs> I mean, it's a true grindhouse movie that would have been playing on 42nd Street, New York City at one in the morning. And, uh, you know, and the, the bikers they used were real outlaw bikers. And a lot of the shots are this them doing their thing. But um, I mean, it's it's again with the Satan worshiping. It's fucking epic. Some great black masses. And it's just a, a wonderful film. I, I, I adore it. And, and I think that movie uh, maybe specifically was what um, Rob Zombie was trying to do with his um, grindhouse trailer, fake trailer, the. Nazi werewolves, right? But it really is absolutely it is trying to grab that sort of uh, (laughs) low budget, just uh, you know, exploitation nastiness. Absolutely, it is. And Paul Nashi released another one in 1972 with Fury of the Wolfman. The rats are coming. The werewolves are here. In 1972, is one of Andy Milligan's horror films. Stephen King describes his filmmaking technique as. Morons with cameras in his book, Dancy Macabre. So <laughs> just leave it at that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I think this has got like a 
2.5 in IMDb or something. <laughs> it's awful. I'm surprised it's got that good of a rating. <laughs> but believe it or not, that's the only Stephen King book I've never read. Oh, it's really it's nonfiction. It's really great. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a little bit dated now because, but it's it's good. Yeah. 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 Agreed. It is great though. And Paul Nashie keeps churning them out with Dr. Jekyll and the Wolfman in 1972. And 1972 saw the beginning of made-for-television werewolf movies with Moon of the Wolf. And I don't know how I, I ended up with a VHS copy of this made-for-television werewolf movie that takes place in Louisiana. And it was at a time in my life when I was like completely off-grid and in the middle of the woods. And it was one of the only movies I had. So I used to watch it over and over and over. It's a, it's, it's got a real nostalgic feel to me. <laughs> Under, I can understand that, right, Mark? I know, I know about nostalgia, don't I? The only movies Jim likes are ones that he watched when he was a, a young Jim. <laughs> uh, in 1973, now we uh, we get Japan coming into the game uh, with Horror of the Wolf, based on the manga Wolf Guy. Ooh. Ooh. Curse of the Devil in 1973. More from Spanish filmmaker Paul Nashi. Werewolves get political in 1973's The Werewolf of Washington, a comedy making fun of the Nixon administration where, spoiler alert, the President of the United States becomes a werewolf at the end. I thought they could update that for today, didn't they? That would be <laughs> great, dude. That would be so good. <laughs> the Boy Who Cried Werewolf was released in 1973. Brought to you by Nathan Dran, the same guy who made The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. One of my mother's favorite films. He's a great filmmaker, man. Yeah. You know, and uh, back to television. Uh, well, Scream of the Wolf was the ABC movie of the week on January 16th, 1974. And it was made by Dark Shadows creator Dan Curtis. So, you know, we didn't we're not going to get into television because we would be here like literally for days. <laughs> But of course, uh, Dark Shadows had werewolves in it. And interesting that um, since we're discussing the mythology, there was many ways you could be turned into a werewolf, uh, which is curse, being bitten, or because it just ran in the family. And uh, Dark Shadows was really like the American horror story of its time. You know, that TV show, taking all these myths and just cramming them together, not always too gracefully. Little fact of trivia, I own all 1074 episodes on dvd i almost bought it it was so did you how much did you pay like 600 bucks for that i will not discuss that right now because my wife wouldn't <laughs> let me buy it we're like you, and it, did it come in a coffin is it the one in the coffin it is not no no i wanted to buy that so bad and we love that shit we used to netflix it, has them on yeah. dvd i don't think they're streaming them but you can get the dvds even even the 1990s reboot was fantastic i mean it was a little more we're gonna get well to that together <laughs> you think see i I don't know. We'll, we'll talk about it in a minute. <laughs> we'll talk about it in a minute when we get there. Um, I want to talk about 1974's The Beast Must Die. I think this is an amazing movie everyone should watch. So this is really a play on like an Agatha Christie 10 little Indians type oh, mystery. That's a great And this is, this is the only movie in movie history that has a werewolf break in it. So towards the end of the movie, the movie stops. It puts a clock on the screen and it gives you 60 seconds to see if you can figure out who the werewolf is. Nice. Huh. Nice. So, uh, yeah, it, it's amazing. And, and it is so 70s. It's got a 70s disco track. It's fantastic. Uh, Calvin Lockhart is basically a big game hunter. And um, he invites a number of people um, to his mansion out in the woods. Um, and he thinks one of them, at least one of them, may be a werewolf, and he's going to hunt them down whenever they change into a werewolf. Uh, Peter Cushing's in this as well, and um, it's just absolutely just bonkers, fantastic. Check it out, people. Yep. So, Night of the Howling Beast, also in 1974, Paul Nashie again gives us homage to the werewolf of London by setting this in Tibet. The Werewolf of Woodstock was made for television in 1975 and features a werewolf loose in, you guessed it, the famous 1969 rock concert at Woodstock, New York. Uh, Everyone knows I'm I'm a hippie, I guess. 
guilty. <laughs> and uh, of course, I tried to find this movie to watch it. I, I, I can't find it really. Maybe if anybody's got a link, they could send it to me, send it to the show. Uh, I, there are clips of it, a bunch of clips, and it looks so bad. I mean, like, I, it's hard to put into words how atrocious this Matt, fucking movie Matt, looks. Matt, how could a movie called The Werewolf of Woodstock look bad? Well, they bad? they don't even have, like, the at the concert or whatever, there's nobody even there. It's just like an open field with this guy in a terrible werewolf mask running around in the middle of the day, too. While like it's probably like the produ- the director's cousin's band playing on this like little tiny rickety stage, and uh, I mean it, it, it fucking bad. looks. I mean it may, it looks like Plan Nine from Outer Space is a masterpiece compared to this thing. Like seriously, they maybe um, they maybe should have unleashed some werewolves in that Woodstock redo that they did. Um, what it was that in the nineties? On ninety nine, ninety nine. Woodstock 99. Just absolute train wreck. <laughs> oh my God. We can't start in the middle of that. We'll be there forever. That is, I had a bunch of friends that were all there and shit. And like, oh, really? Yeah, I'm not going to. The, the looting started because they were charging like $6 for a little bottle of water. water and it was right? like 100 degrees on black pavement. And he's like, they, he's like, well, yeah, we're all just like all a bunch of crazy punk rock hippies. We immediately looted the water. And like, then when the water got looted, Cause they're like the water should be fucking free or at least affordable. I mean, you could have <laughs> killed people by not giving them water. And then he's like, the next booth next to it was GameStop. Yeah, and we, he's like, everyone just turned around and looked at GameStop and was like, "All right, let's go." There's a real, there's a really, there's a really, there's a really good documentary about it. There's a bunch of them. Yeah, but one on Netflix, one on HBO. Yeah. Anyway, back to the werewolves. <laughs> Don't get me started on hippie bullshit, man. I'll, I'll be here all day, dude. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, we'll continue on with 1975's The Legend of the Werewolf. Peter Cushing back again uh, in another werewolf movie. Um, and this is a British classic about a wolf boy from a freak show. Uh, freak shows, Peter Cushing and werewolves, you can't go wrong there. True. And in 1975, the werewolf movie starts getting arty and surreal with the French film The Beast. This one is a total cult classic, highly erotic, known for graphic sexual content, including bestiality images and some hardcore werewolf sex with actual penetration. So if you want to see what a werewolf's dick looks like, check out this arty 70s French film. And there there was a lot of hair in the 70s. <laughs> dude, his dick, his dick is covered in hair, dude. It's completely covered in hair, dude. <laughs> taking, it, taking it to a new level. I'll probably skip that one. Not really. <laughs> I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, in 1977, there's Werewolf Woman, a weird 70s Italian horror from Reno di Silvestro, who directed exploitation classics like Women of Cell Block 77 and Departed Women of the SS. In this one, a woman has dreams that she is a werewolf, so she goes out and finds men. She proceeds to have sex with them and then rips their throats out with her teeth. So, again, if Italian sexploitation werewolves are your thing, check it out. I know that they're marks for sure, so... Yeah, I'll probably pass on this one. I am something of a scientist myself, you know. You like uh-huh. the Italian flicks, though. He does, no, he did. does. No, I do, I do. Uh, they're good. I mean, they're... So, so... Well, oh my that, god, my that, son just that. watched Salo the other day, dude. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm like, yeah. dude, you didn't. He's like, he's like, it is ingenious. It's a it's a a, a indictment against fascism. fascism. And like, I'm like, I, I when I watched it, I was just like, oh no. He, he's... <laughs> no, no, no uh chocolate soft serve ice cream after that movie. Yeah, I know. And, that, the, and the director was killed for it. He was shot. That's right. Yes, the director was fucking shot. He was, a, he, yeah. He got assassinated. Like, you know, there, there's a lot of there's a lot you can talk about about Mussolini's Italy and the effect that it had on. They were all werewolves. It's a fact. <laughs> he was a bald werewolf. <laughs> Paul Nashie uh, brings us into the '80s with Night of the Werewolf in 1980, where the werewolf is the lover of the Blood Countess Elizabeth Bathory. Now we did an episode on Elizabeth, or. Erzbit Bauturi, as some insist she be called, 
And there are people out there who will be like, you're not pronouncing it right if you don't say Erzbit Bautori. But uh, anyway, we talked about uh, her image and how like she's just been so exploited throughout the ages and she ends up in all these insane, crazy horror movies. And this is one of them. And then 1981 ushers in the gilded age of cinematic lycanthropy when on April 10th, the howling is released. I, I, I think this is where we get the transformation as far as uh, special effects. Yeah. Um, we can talk about this a little bit more with Rob uh, Bottom. Yeah, with American Werewolf in London. Um, but before, it, it just wasn't very good. <laughs> I mean, they, they, <laughs> they did, they did what they well. did. Well, uh, I mean, mm. right. <laughs> for the time, it was okay. It definitely right. brings it to a new level. It's yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I always find the howling kind of it feels like an exploitation movie to me. It it, it is. I mean, it's a cheaper kind of film. Um, Rob Bottom had actually been helping with the special effects on American Werewolf in London, and he was really young at the time, and they didn't have the money to get Rick Baker. He was just way too much money, so he went over there and it was one of some of his first special effects. It's it's very cartoony. He uh, based the werewolf totally on uh, it's not Bugs Bunny, you know that classic with the were with the wolf and the and the little pigs. They show the shot in the movie. Yeah, I think they show it during the transformation scene. If I, yeah, they do. But um, there's something very sexual about this movie. Of course, there's the the werewolf hippie orgy at the end. It's also very yeah. hippie. It's all about California. But that opening scene when he's transforming in the porn theater. And there's a rape being shown at during the peep show. And he's turning into this monster as you like, I mean, this is a fucking graphic fucking image of these guys grabbing this girl to rape her. And I don't know, that shit fucked me up in the head as a little kid. So bad. I sorry, I'm still like, I still associate werewolves and horror with that. I think maybe that's why it's so proud, profound on me because that shit fucking made my heart hurt and my brain. That's funny. I was just gonna say that's funny that you mentioned that because like I don't I've seen this movie, but I don't like I don't remember it very well. I like constantly always think that I haven't seen it. And then when I go and I look at it, I'm like, oh, yeah, I've seen that movie. And that is the scene that like is the thing that helps me remember that it like that has not left my head either. It's weird. I'm so insane. It's, it, it, it's, fun. It's, it's kind of funny because both The Howling and An American Werewolf in London, both of scenes in a porn theater. Yes. <laughs> yes what's going on it, it's will... about the inner beast and the and and sex is part of that inner beast you know i mean we're doing uh all these serial killers that have been called werewolves and you know it's just like that like this animal comes out of them and it's largely sexual i'll be honest this uh the the howling i cried at the end when d wallace transforms on camera <laughs> what I, I was in tears I mean, m- mind you, I was very, very young when I saw this movie, but I did. I, I physically cried when Aww. I saw th- that last scene in the movie. Oh, she does have a very sympathetic look to her eyes. She does. And, uh, and, and that's and exactly they, she what She turns is. into the cutest little werewolf before they kill her. <laughs> she does. Her little nose twitches. It's great. Yeah. Like and I actually, almost. I got to tell her that story when I met her at Spooky last year. Hell yeah. That is awesome. Okay, enough about Jim's trauma. <laughs> we have to deal with it every freaking week. We can move forward in 1981. In July, it would, we would see the classic, the uh, sorry, Wolfen, based on the Whitley Stryber novel. You're a heart writer and you can't say Whitley Stryber? Come on. <laughs> I've, never, I've never read Whitley Stryber. Apparently oh, this? You need yeah, to read Fire in the Sky 100%. Yeah. It's fantastic. No, it's not. He got movie. blackballed from the horror community because he believes in aliens and, and says yes. he's abducted. And it's no. it's a rabbit no hole, Krista. That, You're gonna go down. Yeah, absolutely. You know I'm going. You know I'm going. You, know I'm going you, you going need to. This. You really like, need well, to. In the well, 80s, well, he was a really famous horror writer. Yeah. Okay. He also wrote The Hunger. You know, with David Bowie, the David Bowie yeah. movie. Yeah, the vampire yeah, movie. Yeah, yeah. One I my mean, favorite movies. But Whitley Stryber uh, later came out and said that he just made up um, the yeah. alien stuff just for the, the novel and he thought it would you know sell better if he's like yes yeah, he said it's that but he, dude, he said that after so like literally like what decades of i don't know man i don't know it it's just fire a, in the sky it was it was the one with um 
It's a good movie. It is. That's, it's that's fantastic. Fire in the Sky is, but that's not the one that we're talking about. It's the communion. one with... communion. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Well, Wolfen, as uh, we see here, is, was another werewolf story based on the Native American mythology of the Skinwalker. But yeah, I got to check out that novel. Yeah, you do. Yeah, it's, it's a good movie too. Um, all these, this is like the trilogy. And can I get a drum roll, please, from somebody? <laughs> <laughs> and on August 21st, 1981, John Landis released An American Werewolf in London and changed the life and childhood of an entire generation. I don't think I've heard of this one. Is it any good? <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> Sorry, American Werewolf. Maybe the greatest movie London? ever made. Maybe, maybe the greatest film. I mean, better than Citizen Kane, better it, than it The Godfather. It is my first foray into a little bit more horror comedy. I I absolutely loved the scenes with David and uh, in, in the movie theater. It was. I'm Jack sorry, I called you a meatloaf. <laughs> so so I for me, this is my favorite werewolf movie. Uh, for a lot of people, I think it probably is too, because it just nails everything like perfectly. Right. So first of all, you have these hitchhikers. They're already strangers in a strange land, right? And they're just walking around and <laughs> stay off the moors. Stay mm -hmm. off the moors. Um, they're like, okay, what? And then we get then we get some of the kind of older mythology, right? So whenever they get into the slaughtered land pub, you have the pentagram on the wall, and they're all like, what's this? And it's almost a melding of like the modern day back then and kind of that older mythology. He says Universal uh, Studios, though. He's like, the five-pointed star is the Universal yeah. Symbol Studio, symbol of the werewolf. Uh, and you made me miss. My... What's that? What? You made me oh, you miss made me miss. Yeah, you made me miss. Totally. Um, and there's also a lot of like old world thing. It's like this American comes back and an American a Jew comes back to old Europe. And, and and encounters all this stuff. Famously, in the dream sequence, we have these werewolf Nazis. Yeah, and it's like again, we see the idea of a werewolf as a Nazi of the of this like bestial ancient European kind of fucking ugliness and rawness bursting out of people. You know, even in the subconscious because it's a dream scene, and it's it's one of the most amazing dream scenes of all time. And it's got the double dream in it. I guess right. there's nobody who hasn't seen it. So fucking fuck, fuck yeah. the spoilers, right? <laughs> like, right. So it's an amazing, amazing film. Mark, you want to talk about the transformation scene? Um, there's a transformation scene in it, Jim? I think so. I've, I've heard What's something about play? one. So, this well, 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 kind of what I want to do before that is um, if you look at the character of David, he's built up um, so well. Like, he is so sympathetic. Um, you know, initially he runs away <laughs> when the werewolf attacks, which to me is one of the best scenes in any movie, that I initial think... werewolf attack. Uh, because I remember whenever I was a kid watching this, and I was probably way too young, uh, whenever I watched it, and that scared the shit out of me. <laughs> Just the howling around it. Yeah. And um, then it's like the the false scare, right? Whenever Jack falls over. Right? Oh, shit, what's happened? Um, and I'm then... <laughs> Yeah, and then he gets attacked. And that is vicious. And um, maybe this is a question for later about which type of werewolf do we all prefer. Um, I prefer the quadrupedal one. Um, I much more prefer the more animalistic uh, large wolf than a guy running around uh, with hair on his face. Um, but they, they really get the tone um, exactly perfect here with the comedy, the horror, mm -hmm. Um, like his friend coming back, Jack coming back all the time, and the love story. More, yeah, in more and more deteriorating form. Right, he's just like getting looks worse and worse and worse, and he just keeps on telling him, "Listen, there's no way out of this, David. You're either going to live and can and turn around and start killing people, um, or you can just kill yourself. Make that choice." And, you know, it, it's so blunt, but it's correct, right? I mean, he can't get out of it. There's no cure. There's no nothing. Um, 
So I, I absolutely love it. And then we get the end. And there's no silver bullets in this one either, right? Um, just shot by the police at the end, um, which is kind of weird for British police of guns. But I mean, they had to go. I think they showed. They made it a point of showing them go get going to get them. Right. Yeah. Hmm. Whereas you know, if it was a British uh, werewolf in um, I don't know New York, oh here they've been shot in the first night, <laughs> so, just by the general populace, not even the not even the cops. All right, the greatest werewolf film of all time, in many yeah. many's opinion. And then good old Larry Cohen. I'm sure you guys are a fan of him. He I love us- Larry Cohen. Uh, he has recently passed away, so uh, rest in peace. Uh, he brought us the teen comedy Full Moon High in 1981, which was a precursor to the Teen Wolf type films. Sorry, yeah, just to interject real quick. Um, have you seen the documentary King Cohen about Larry Cohen? I watched parts of it. Yeah, I, like late it's at night, amazing. falling asleep. It's amazing because it talks all about his like guerrilla filmmaking and you know no permits, no nothing, just get on the right. street. And, yeah. Do it. Yep. And Paul Nashi goes to Japan this time to bring us the 10th of his werewolf movies, The Beast and the Magic Sword in 1983. And 1984 brings us The Company of Wolves, which I just love. I love this movie. It's based on the short story by Angela Carter. It's super gothic, super atmospheric, heavily based on Little Red Riding Hood, uh, surreal with an iconic transformation scene where the snout of the wolf comes out the guy's mouth and then he just kind of like sheds the skin away and uh, if you like like fairy tales and gothic stuff and it's a little slow it's not like really that scary uh definitely check it out if that's your your thing it, it is a very Go, go ahead. ahead. Sorry, go Krista. Ahead. I knew no, you would have it, Krista. Yeah. <laughs> I was just gonna say I love it, and I like I loved the Angela Carter story. So yeah, I love this movie. And I'm gonna be the exact opposite of you, Krista. I hated this movie. <laughs> I tried watching it three times, and I just got so bored I had to shut it off. Yeah, I mean, like like Matthew said, it's it's kind of I a think it's slow a, burn. <laughs> I think it's a very niche movie because I've heard a lot of great things about it, but I just it's just not my kind of movie. I mean, I can appreciate the cinematography and, and the storytelling and all that, but I just can't get into it enough to actually want to finish that film. Yeah, I mean, I, I believe me, I do get it. We're um, Angela Carter fans, though, so. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, so, yeah, kind of uh, on the other side of the pendulum here, Michael J. Fox hit the big screen in 1985 with Teen Wolf. Jim, yep. do you like this one? <laughs> I do. I absolutely love this movie. But the thing I, I was telling uh, everybody about earlier is this is the first movie where they almost directly say like the um that this is related to puberty because the father tries to give him that talk where he talks mm-hmm. you know every embarrassing kid's nightmare you're going to go experience some changes you're going to see these things changing and i think it just harkens back to all the movies like the this brings us to our baser instincts right where your sex drive starts to kick in where you start to become more aggressive you start to and you have to learn to control that and that's what he does through this entire movie is he gets in touch with that animalistic side and learns to um, take control of the parts that are good and repress the parts that are bad. And just to interject here as well, thinking about you know the whole puberty thing and werewolves, um, even though the first werewolf movie had a woman and there has obviously been like ginger snaps like that, is it interesting that it's primarily men <laughs> who are turned? Yeah, it's primarily men who are serial killers. Well, I mean, but if you think about it, though, it's primarily women other than Dracula that you see in the vampire movies where they are sensual and they are seductive and they are taking that that by that bull by the horns to take that role. Right. Absolutely. Look at Dracula, Bram Stoker's Dracula. You got one Dracula. He's got three wives. There's three vampires right behind him. And he goes to England. And the first thing he does is start turning the women in the vampires. You get Lucy. She's a great vampire. You know, Oh, she's fantastic. That's a great character. I, d- I do think maybe in the last even maybe even in the last five years, definitely in the last 10, there have been more films centered around young female m- protagonists going through puberty with the werewolf motif. I was just thinking um, like Wildling is one. And When Animals Dream, that was another like kind of recent one that I liked that kind of switched it up a bit. 
Damn it. Wait, we should have put them on the list. Right? <laughs> Sorry. I, it, just, it just came to me. I, it, it just popped into my head uh, when we were talking about that. Well, we'll get to ginger snaps in a minute. Yeah. And of course, I mean, movies are a reflection on society at the time, too. So yep. as we progress, we will see more and more diversity in our werewolves. Mm-hmm. I also think, I don't know if this is the time to talk about it, but I also think and maybe we can like talk more about it at the end, that there are a lot of movies that have come out recently that are like werewolf adjacent, um, like, and I didn't put this on the list either, but um, another like young female going through puberty kind of thing. Was that movie Raw? Mm-hmm. And it's oh, more, yeah, it's a great uh, movie. Yeah, no, it's, great it's, movie. Can, it's more just straight cannibalism, but there's definitely like an element of that werewolf transformation, the losing control. Um, the beast within. Yeah. And then this isn't really fitting in with the puberty elements, but werewolf adjacent stuff than than just kind of wolf sort like we talked to matthew um just briefly the other day off off air about that hunter hunter film that came out you didn't get a chance to watch Mm -hmm. it i feel like there's a lot of cool stuff where it's like they kind of are the directors or the people writing these films are like very well versed in the lore of werewolf films and they just decided to like i'm gonna do kind of like a werewolf film without a werewolf and it still touches on all the same themes um, yeah, and, yeah. I gotta watch it. And, and even like not even a transformation. If you think about it, you know, um, ancient Rome, right? Yeah. Who founded that? Romulus and Remus. We get uh, all into that they, in our history of the werewolves yeah. episode. Yeah, there's a lot of Roman wolf right. stuff. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, uh, and course, you go to Italy, and there's statues everywhere of little and, kids sucking on the were on the wolf's yeah. teat. So, uh, and, and the badge for Roma, the football club, or sorry, soccer club. <laughs> His Irish is coming up, uh, but the badge of that is Romulus and Remus sucking on sucking on the she wolf teats. So it takes I a mean, minute to get still... used to, and you're not used to it. The first time you see, you're like the fuck, and then, <laughs> then you notice it's everywhere, man. But, uh, yeah, so so Silver Bullet, 1985 classic Stephen King uh, movie based on Cycle of the Werewolf, and this one kind of like uh, the Beast Must Die. This is almost like a like a mystery movie right so right. it's like who is the werewolf and um you know gary boosie you would think is a werewolf i think he's a werewolf in real life <laughs> so obviously i would think he's a werewolf in this but no he's not um i, I actually didn't see this until maybe 10 years ago for whatever reason but um yeah i really enjoy it i think it's fun i love the book because mo- the majority of the book is just violent death scenes. Yeah. And the story doesn't come into like the last third of the book. So I totally. really. It's a calendar. I, it is essentially. And I it's absolutely. Every full I, moon in the in the year. Yeah. Yep. And I absolutely loved the layout of the book. The movie, because I'd read the book already, felt a little forced to me because they put they had to add so much additional story to make it an actual cohesive movie. I agree, man. I felt the same way. I remember that book was huge. I got that when I was like, I don't know, 12, 13. I, rem- yep. I can still remember begging my mom at the bookstore, like, please, you know, yeah. and like, oh, my God, I love that book so much. And then when the movie came out, I was like, this. I was so excited, too. Yeah. And I was like, this sucks. It's not. Yeah. yeah I was not into it, but. Oh, I, I was just also remember. not into The Howling 2, Your Sister's a Werewolf. With Sybil Dannon and uh, Christopher Lee that came out the same year. I remember this movie because of Sybil Danning, but I do not remember ever watching it. I'm sure I did at some point, but it's utterly forgettable. There's what, like seven Howling movies now or something? We go through each and every one of them. <laughs> uh, also in 1985, Transylvania 65000, a very goofy Jeff Goldblum weird comedy. Love it. It is very weird. I love it. Love it. And rock and roll icon Alice Cooper. Hell yeah. Stars as the werewolf in the Spanish movie Monster Dog in 1986, playing a rock star. Shocking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also in 1986, the horror comedy anthology Dead Time also had a werewolf in it. Unfortunately, That's kind of cult following. Yeah. Right? Does it? Yeah. Yeah, I have never even heard of that anthology before. So 1987 gives us the unfortunate sequel, Teen Wolf 2. 
and more <laughs> cheesy comedy for kids with the Monster Squad in 1987. Oh, I love that movie. You will never, ever speak bad about that movie in my presence. I'm just saying. <laughs> well, done. Uh, deal. Uh, the Howling <laughs> 3, they came out. Here's the third one. This one's called The Marsupials. Uh, hmm. Who the fuck decided to name a horror? Does that sound? Did, did someone's like? <laughs> they're all Australian too. I could try to do an Australian well, accent, but well, like, are they? Oh, might, are they? A marsupial? Doesn't that sound scary? Right? <laughs> are they? Are they platypi? Cool. What are they? That means you have a little pouch in your belly, you know. And uh, so, like, where kangaroos? <laughs> yes, and it's just like like Kanga and Roo and Winnie the Pooh. Yep, like fangs and claws. Right. And then just to seal the coffin, they decided to make it PG-13 rather than R. Uh, and luckily, course. it's the only PG-13 movie in the Howling franchise. That's not a werewolf. <laughs> this is a werewolf. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Very good. <laughs> good night, Mike. <laughs> Strip of the body. Um, okay, so this next movie is one of my favorite movies. Um, and I actually met Zach Gallagher um, at a convention that had him sign. Um, this poster and it, it is awesome. Waxwork, uh, 1988. And I also think this is what, even though it's only a small part of the movie, I actually think this is one of the best representations of a werewolf in a movie. Um, it's only maybe 10 minutes long, but the werewolf looks amazing in it. And it, the scene is just shot so well. And I love it. I love it. And I love the whole movie. And I love the sequel. Waxwork, check it out, people. So The Howling 4, The Original Nightmare, is a 1988 British film which tried to be more faithful to the original novel. Followed by Howling 5, Rebirth. Uh, I don't think this straight-to-video 1989 movie had anything to do with any of the other Howling movies. It's about a mysterious count in a Hungarian castle. Almost sounds like subspecies. The made-for-TV movie It in 1990, featuring Tim Curry in an iconic role as Pennywise. This also had a werewolf in it. I remember it quite fondly. It was it was actually maybe one of the less cheesy, you know. I, it's the, classic. It's great. You no, know, it, yep. yep. it is. It is. I, it's and of course, it's the Wolfman from the original Wolfman movie, right? Right. right. It's his right. fears becoming that, manifest. Yeah. 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 Um, British made 1991 direct video, which is always a good sign. Uh, how <laughs> six the freaks it involves another freak show. It seems to be a recurring theme with a lot of werewolf type movies. Um, and uh, again, kind of like Peter Cushing's Legend of the Werewolf from 1975. Um, again, it's kind of a trope at this point, but uh, yeah. Lock the wolf man in a cage and make people uh, pay some money to see it. Make some money off that creature. Yeah, right? Absolutely. A werewolf western, which is decidedly not my cup of tea, Mad at the Moon, was released in 1992. I love the idea of a werewolf western, yeah. honestly. I think it, for some reason, I, I do not know why well. the tropes go together for me. I don't know. If, yeah. it's cheesy, if it's cheesy, it could be great. But if and it's I, not, it's going to be a giant miss for me. I, yeah, that's kind of, agreed. It kind of goes back to the Lone Ranger, right? The yeah, get an OG with it. Yeah. That's the cycle of the werewolf. <laughs> <laughs> so Full Eclipse in 1993 was a science fiction crime movie featuring police officers with the power to turn into a werewolf. We'll talk about another one of those soon, right? <laughs> yeah, there's, unfortunately, there's a bunch of them. And, and then 1994 brought us the classic Wolf with Michelle Pfeiffer and Jack Nicholson. It's been a long time since i seen this but i remember thinking it was pretty good and I, I know a lot of people like it it's... i thought it was fantastic and i will say that and since the movie came out the year i graduated high school I'm not afraid to talk about spoilers um knowing that michelle pfeiffer is the main wolf in the movie you, which you find out at the end i think is probably the first time i saw a female in that position of power in, in a werewolf movie nice nice I I think it's ultimately forgettable because I watched it and I don't remember anything about it. <laughs> well, we know you like Houseu, so you don't count. <laughs> I'm a huge Michelle Pfeiffer fan, oh, by the way. Same. I just love her, man. Grease too. Under fantastic. Under, yes. Underappreciated. Oh, totally. I still sing that soundtrack to this day. <laughs> oh, don't don't get Jim on like musicals. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, now we have some. Uh, 
good old 1995 <laughs> straight to video uh, Project Metal Beast. What a name. Uh, well, well this, is, this is one I've seen. Project but Metal Beast. I remember, but it, it's like they make a werewolf, but then they give it like impenetrable, like metal skin. <laughs> so it can be shot by silver bullets. I don't remember. I think King, King Hotter might be in this one. It's been so long. I don't so remember. essentially, this is a werewolf becomes Colossus from the X-Men. Right. Okay. Good to know. Howling 7, New Moon Rising, a comedy from 1995 that reuses footage from the other films. Also British made, also direct to video. Monster Mash in 1995 was a musical comedy with all the classic monsters and a reanimated Elvis Presley. I don't know how I missed this one. I need to look this up immediately. <laughs> I, I, I don't even understand that. Uh, Elvis is still alive, so how could he be reanimated? <laughs> It's an, it's an alternate reality. Yeah. Uh, 1996 had a movie called The Werewolf, direct-to-video dud. And uh, this one's pretty well known for being mocked on Mystery Science Theater. Oh, those guys. <laughs> I love them. Um, I, and now we go uh, north of the border to uh, Canada, eh? And they jumped into the game with Bad Moon, uh, where a werewolf apologizes after eating several victims. I don't know if that's true. <laughs> but that's, that's true. Very good. <laughs> Paul Dashi still pumping them out in 1997. He puts out Lycanthropus, Lycanthropus, the Moonlight Murders. Did not see this one. This time introducing a serial killer into the story. An American Werewolf in Paris, 1997. Let's just not talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Agreed. I, I watched that shit once. It's fine. I, 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 <laughs> I think that I was mean, the was that the first CGI werewolf. Yeah. Yes, they, this and is it, where they started. It was too this, much. This. It was just too much. It the CGI was too much, and the story was terrible. Yeah. So. All right. Well, if we're moving on from that, the werewolf makes it into the 21st century with the absolutely delightful Ginger Snaps in 2000. Two death obsessed sisters, outcasts in their suburban neighborhood. They must deal with the tragic consequences when one of them is bitten by a deadly werewolf. I I love this movie. I've actually like purposely never watched any of the other Ginger Snaps because I figured they would be shit. So I'm I'm oh, stuck no. in the, the, yeah, the second the 2000s. The just, second one is good, Krista. Yeah, the third okay. one they lost me. I like the third one. We'll get to it in a hot second. <laughs> yeah, okay. but um, I I mean I am just a huge Catherine Isabel fan. Yeah, uh, she can do no wrong to, to me. So. Of course, I like the sequels, and, but uh, and the, this and movie the, yep. is so good. And uh, Jim, again, this is another one about puberty, but this yep. time through the gr woman's perspective. Yep, absolutely. And you, you see that they, they start going through these changes. They start to take control of their animalistic side. But unfortunately, like in the first film, the older sister loses herself to the beast, whereas the other one, the younger sister, tries to control it. And yes. the, younger, the younger sister was the girl from the it tv movie was she in that yes yeah, yeah. she was a young uh, oh uh, yeah yeah the yeah, younger yeah. version of of the which i, I kind of i yeah, did yeah, you. I, I was gonna I say i didn't Beth. realize that until like a while after i'm like how did i not see that yeah uh, right. we, we could also talk about with this movie uh typo negative any typo negative fans i know a song so so uh they do a, a song called uh wolf moon all about uh, basically <laughs> women turning into werewolves when they have their period because <laughs> it's like when the moon comes around, you know, it's that certain sort of thing. So hmm. yeah. it is lunar, huh? Um, you know, there's a the, you guys know about the old French thing with the beast of Gavadon. There was like this uh, wolf killing all these people back in France. We were mm -hmm. I was gonna try to cover it in our werewolf episode, but we ran out of time. It's not. It's not really a werewolf. It's like this. Um, was it, it was an actual wolf. They found it and killed it and uh, put it on display. But Brotherhood of the Wolf in 2001 is a historical story about that. But they give it the cool werewolf twist. All right, you guys. Wolf Girl is a really interesting one about a girl with a rare genetic condition known as hypertrichosis. You know that where, where they're like all covered yeah. in hair. Yeah. And so she works at a freak show as the wolf girl. Again, we're seeing that uh, freak show trope. And Tim Curry, our boy, is the head of the freak show. And, and this is a really good movie. 
It's, I think it's Canadian. It's really well made. It's arty. It's suspenseful. And mm-hmm. if you like freak show stuff, definitely give it a watch. And if you like Tim Curry as well. I've never seen Tim Curry in anything I didn't like. Now we move on to a modern classic. And this is Neil Marshall's Dog Soldiers, which has kind of a tagline. It's like Jaws meets Predator. And that didn't make any sense to me. And I wonder no. if the person that uh, made that tagline actually watched the movie. Really what it is, it's one part Predator and one part Night of the Living Dead. Um, and basically we have a um, British Army unit um, who is uh, in like the Scottish Highlands on maneuvers. Um, and they come across some werewolves. Um, the beauty in this movie is like, um, it's maybe a good question for um, the rest of you because I'm from the UK. So I understand all that sort of banter between like like the people. I don't know if that translates very well over here. I I will say I saw this movie very recently, like within the last three or four years. And I didn't have any problem with it as an adult. I don't okay. know if I had seen it, you know, closer to 2002 when it premiered, if I would have had that same understanding. I think all soldiers yeah. banter like that. I mean, they don't obviously they don't have the accents, but I mean, you watch American war films and you'll see kind of like, you know, and that camaraderie and all that. Yeah. But yeah. Dog I, Soldiers I, is uh is it's it's iconic, huh? It's like yeah. huge, huge fan base. People love it. They do, and, and of, I I did too when I finally saw it. Of course, of course, they have like an opening scene with it, it's almost like a night. Uh, sorry, a Friday the Thirteenth, uh, camping. Jason kills uh, a couple of campers, and they introduce introduce Chekhov's silver letter opener, which the girl is <laughs> giving the guy. I'm like. Who like okay, who opens ladders anymore and who has a silver letter opener? I think in two thousand two people were still opening letters, but email was just just getting started, Mark, so there were still letter openers, yes. Well, you are the IT expert. Um, but they also have the foreshadowing of the dog at the start, right? Where uh, Cooper is uh, told to shoot this dog and he's like not doing that. Um and you know, dogs, wolves. I mean, we could probably talk a lot about that, but um, well, there's I mean, another this... movie that took that too, right, Mark? What the dog in the beginning of the film? What every dog dies in every horror movie. You're talking about, the, um, I'm yeah. talking about the thing where oh, the thing, if, if yes. they, yeah, if they understood what they were telling him, they would understand that if they killed the dog, this whole thing would have been over. Yeah, so th- that's exactly very, right. Yeah. Very interesting point about that because people have asked about. Hey, whenever this movie was shown in Norway, do they just already know what's going on because they understood yes. what, what they were saying? That's not <laughs> I've seen the translation. I'm a, such a huge fan of the thing, and I've yeah. I've yeah I've had Norwegian people translate it, and it's like yeah, it's in the dog, it's in the dog. The dog's a monster. The dog's a monster. That's what he's saying. Yeah. Before Wolf of Wall Street, there was Wolves of Wall Street in 2002, which is exactly what it sounds like, stockbrokers who are literal werewolves. Can you imagine someone who went to watch the Scorsese film and ended up accidentally watching this? I probably would have enjoyed the Scorsese film more if it was this. (laughs) You did like it? (laughs) No, not a fan. Oh my God, huge fan, love it. Underworld. Boom, 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 comes out in 2003, bringing a huge new franchise where werewolves and vampires are at war. Anyway, you guys like that movie? Uh, I did enjoy the first two. After that, the storyline gets too convoluted if you go past the third film and it just gets ridiculous for me. Yeah, I agree with that. But I did. I liked the first one. First. Yeah, I thought they were fun. Yeah. Yeah. They're goofy. You don't have to think. Exactly. There, there's, and I mean, Kate Beckinsale is fantastic in her leather leotard. Hell yeah! Also, in two thousand three, Tim Burton's Big Fish has a werewolf in it. I love that movie. Fun movie. I, I've never finished the film, to be honest. I've never seen and it. there's, there's no particular reason for it. I just, I got interrupted when I was watching it, so I've never been able to finish it. Finish it. The ending's the best part. <laughs> um, exhumed a can. Oh, sorry. A Canadian 2003 anthology horror 
film with three stories. The third one about vampires and werewolves being forced to fight zombies in a post-apocalyptic future. Oh, you probably don't want to say post-apocalyptic to Mark. He does not like that term. It's, it's, a, it's a very strange term. Because I, I feel if there's an apocalypse, nobody's left alive. So, so I actually... So- agree and um i i it was kind of a while now i wrote an an essay for nightmare magazine and like kind of broached that topic a little bit how like like again it's like not coming like i wrote i wrote something about that i can't remember now exactly what my whole thesis was but um yeah yeah, i completely agree (laughs) that's funny that you said thanks jim congrats on that that is a hard magazine to get into yeah. Thanks. Yeah. It was just it was nonfiction, so not not a fiction piece, but yeah. It's during the pandemic that I wrote it. So and we're coming back to Ginger Snaps too, which Krista did not see. <laughs> uh I, I think it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. The second it's, one was fine. It was like the first part. one. You'll like this one, I think. It wasn't quite as enjoyable as the first film, in my opinion, but it's still a good it's still a good movie. We have Van Helsing in 2004, a fantasy action flick where famed monster hunter Van Helsing is sent to Transylvania to stop Count Dracula, who's using Dr. Frankenstein's research and a werewolf for nefarious purposes. There, the only the only thing about this movie that is remotely redeemable is Hugh Jackman. I like I like I like Dracula's wives. Yeah, they were pretty good. Yeah, I don't, I don't disagree with that. But most of the movie was garbage. Uh, Krista, you remember we talked about um, Manuel Blanco Romosanta, the uh, Spanish serial killer who made soap from the fat of his victims? How could I forget? <laughs> he, he went up on a, He testified in court that he was a werewolf, and that was his defense. Huh. So this one, Romosanta, the werewolf hunt, is based on him. If you like uh, true life serial killer stuff, check it out. Yeah, that one sounds interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, 2004, and um, what was the name of the guy? British Sirius guy. Black. Oh, Gary Oldman. Gary Oldman. Um, and, it, and I think that was the last uh, Harry Potter movie I ever saw. I don't think I watched anything after that. Love Gary Oldman. Hate Harry Potter. So. <laughs> Harry Potter. Just me. If you like Harry, if you like Harry Potter, good on you. Go watch this movie with it's got a werewolf in it. Yeah. Tomb of the Werewolf, the twelfth and last of Paul Nash's werewolf films, was both shot on video and released on video in two thousand four. This one is known for having some straight up pornographic scenes, and again, features Elizabeth Bathory as a vampire. You want some porn and Elizabeth Bathory shot on video? Check it out. I'll, I'll pass. <laughs> And then Ginger snaps back, man. I, I love this movie. It's it's kind of bad. I'm if Jim tells me it's bad, I'm not going to argue with him. <laughs> it's but it's it's just really fun. It's set in the 19th century, and it's like at this old fort, and you know, and everybody's like wearing the old timey clothes and cloaks and stuff, and it's snowing, and they're stuck. They got like logs all set up with spikes on the end to keep out the werewolves, and I don't know. It's got Catherine Isabel in it, so. I'm going to guess I, like anything with Catherine and Isabel. I'm going to like just like uh, Mark likes anything with Sherry Moon Zombie. Oh, yeah. of course. I mean, she is a queen. So oh, I, she's yeah. definitely something. I love her, too. I, I also love her. Well, I'm, I'm glad yeah. to be the, the odd man out then. I will say this to you, Matthew, in your defense. I've only seen this movie one time. So maybe I don't appreciate it enough because I have not tried to rewatch it. I'll, I'll check it out again. It's also another one of those movies that I watched at a time when I didn't have access to a lot of films. Mm -hmm. And like me and my wife would just like curl up in bed and watch it like over and over. And it's just it's very it's very atmospheric. It's like it's the winter and it's snowing and it's old timey. And I don't know. I like it. (laughs) We have Cursed in 2005. Wes Craven directing a werewolf movie starring Christina Ricci. You would think it would be amazing. But the powers that be, Harvey Weinstein actually decided to make it PG-13 after they'd started, then had the audacity to fire Rick Baker. So um, they replaced all the werewolf footage with computer-generated werewolves. Enough said. I think I'm going to be the odd man out again. I love this movie. Really? I do. And I think a lot of it has to do with Christina Ricci because I am such a huge fan of hers. Me too. And I just thought this, I thought it was fun. It was stupid and fun. 
I, I did not go into this expecting an, a movie that I'm, you know, a, a masterpiece. I expected it to be a stupid, fun movie, and I got I, what I expected. I think if you make a PG-13 werewolf movie, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Any horror movie. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, not yeah. PG-13, I think, you know, the changeling and some ghost supernatural stuff is falling, but like a werewolf. No. Yeah, the changeling is a goon. You get me there. The changeling yeah. is garbage. Get me started. Oh my! It's it's you shocked me. (laughs) (laughs) It's boring and it's tried. It's just it's no fun at all. Oh my god! Maybe it's George C. Scott. I watched it. Jeez, George C. Scott. He's a terrible actor. Oh my god! He's got zero range. He was he was built to play a military character, and that's it. He's a fucking broad. He was on Broadway for years. He's a stage actor. I think he's garbage. Jim thinks um, apparently George C. Scott can't emote. As Correct. An actor. Just look in his so, eyes. Did so, you see that movie uh, Hardcore? No. Oh, it's really good. It's about a dude whose daughter gets sucked up into the 1970s oh, yeah, yeah. porn world and goes to Los Angeles to infiltrate the pornography world to find his daughter, George C. Scott. So. Yep. Hmm. You know, I love Terry Gillian. Uh, I'm a huge fan of all of his movies, but somehow I've never seen The Brothers Grimm. Uh, it just the trailer looked so atrocious. I couldn't bring myself to watch it. I don't know, but apparently yeah, there's Ray, werewolves in that. It, Ray it likes the generic. movie. Yeah, Ray likes the movie. I have never seen it. I mean, it I'm a huge like, fan of his work. Yeah. It, it looked like they were just copying the Van Helsing template. Yes. Mm. Essentially, yeah. Uh, 2005's Wild Country is about some Scottish teenagers being stalked by a werewolf while hiking to a castle. It's got some fans. If you're a fan of Scottish films and you want a werewolf movie with some good reviews, check it out. I need to because I've been into Scottish werewolf books recently and I'm, I'm becoming a huge fan. So I need to check this out. People really like it. Yeah. Underworld Evolution, the 2006 sequel, Cementing That World. And then Red uh, Riding Hood in 2006, a fantasy musical. This is Amanda Seyfried. Oh, sorry. Saw it in theaters and just could not stand it. Oh, is this the one with Amanda Seyfried? I love I her. I think so. Yeah. I do too. I do too. And I was extremely disappointed with this film. Um, Skinwalkers had effects by Stan Winston. All you horror freaks probably know him, but um, the, the effects were praised, but Everyone says the movie's garbage. So, The Feeding in 2006 seems to be in the running for one of the worst werewolf movies ever made. Okay. And then we have Big Bad Wolf in 2006. And it's no secret I'm a huge fan of this film. It's campy. It's ridiculous. It's got a lot of gore in it. It's got a smart ass werewolf. And it's got giant werewolf dong. Oh, another werewolf dong. Yeah. And another, a little (laughs) bit of trivia. The main character is uh, Kimberly J. Brown, who many people might know from the Halloween Town series, but in this movie, she's all grown up. All right. Big Bad Wolf. Check it out. Jim's a huge fan. I've actually never seen it, but I've, I have seen a lot of people who really like it. Yeah, it's uh, definitely it's definitely worth it checking out. If you want to see Werewolf Dong, we have some recommendations already. And it's another one, I guess. Jesus Christ, I hope you didn't <laughs> Google that. Uh, 2007, Blood and Chocolate. It's a werewolf love story between a lycanthrope girl and a human that tries to be very arty and comes off pretentious. Sounds like me. Yeah, pretty <laughs> much. You try to come off arty? He does. Really? He does. Uh, well, I try to come off smart. And it's just pretentiousness. It is. <laughs> Frick or Treat in 2007, a classic and one of my personal faves. Yeah, me too. I, I absolutely adore this movie. My son turned me on to this movie, and um, it's a tradition for us to watch it every Halloween. Yeah. It's absolutely fantastic. Unlike 2008's Twilight, which now ushers in a series of films that are just terrible unless you're 13. Yeah, we're just not going to talk about that. <laughs> unless you're a fan, Krista, are you a fan? <laughs> it's not gonna even... Hell no. Uh, Underworld Rise of the Lycans in 2009, uh, an origin story. Uh, I guess this is the one you don't like, Jim. This is this is where they start to lose me. Yes. Yeah. This. 
And then House of the Wolfman in 2009. This is actually a cool fucking movie, you guys. I don't know if you've heard of it, but um, House of the Wolfman, they get Ron Chaney, and this is Lon Chaney Jr.'s grandson. So it'll be the great grandson of Lon Chaney Sr., you know, from like Phantom of the Opera and stuff. And he plays the Wolfman. They film it in black and white. I think they might have actually used old, old black and white film. It looks like that. Otherwise, they use computers to make it look like that. And it, it just looks exactly like a 1940s classic horror movie like House of Frankenstein or something with with the great over over the top dramatic music. It's on YouTube and uh, we'll post a link if you want to get really old school and retro. It's it's a lot of fun. Another another good one to put on in the background during a party. That, like, that sounds like I, I don't know if you've seen uh, the Call of Cthulhu. I did. Yes, that is a, that. Uh, that one's actually they, silent, though, isn't it? Is that? Yeah, silent? They, yeah. Yeah, they made it a silent. This movie one's a well. talkie. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't know about all that. <sighs> talkies. Futuristic. Talkies ruin the movies. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Two thousand and nine, uh, Dark Moon Rising. Uh, Small town girl meets mysterious drifter boy. They fall in love. I'm surprised. He's a werewolf. Another in the Twilight Saga, New Moon. Just gloss right over that one. The Wolfman, 2010. Do you guys like this one? Rick Baker on special effects, Benicio Del Toro, and Anthony Hopkins. Sounds amazing, right? It sounds good. <laughs> but it didn't really do it for me. I don't I don't know why. Maybe this if one, I watch it in a better mood or something, I don't know. This one, was in, this one was in development hell for a long time, and it shows... Right. This is this is a movie I honestly skipped. It's it's not one I've seen, and I don't know why. There's no reason for it. And by the way, anyway, we'll we'll talk about another movie coming up. I I misquoted something earlier. Oh, <laughs> we have one um, more Twilight, the Twilight Saga, Eclipse, 2010. This also happened. Last <laughs> oh, here's the so, one that Jim did not yeah. like. Red correct. Riding Hood. What was yeah. the, what, the other one? Was just called Riding Hood, huh? Just Riding Hood, correct? Yeah. From two thousand six. I I got it mixed up. This one was an art house flick, and it was just terrible. She's so cute, though. She's got the weirdest face. Oh, She's I like absolutely the weirdest love her. eyes. I love her to death, dude. I used to watch that TV show, Big Love. Did you ever? It's about the Mormons. It. All the. No. It's about polygamous Mormons, and she's like the daughter. And she's like, there's something about her. I, I really like her. So in 2011, we have the masterpiece Monster Brawl. It's eight classic monsters fight to the death in an explosive wrestling tournament set inside an abandoned and accursed graveyard. Has anybody seen this? I have not, but I watched the preview. And it, I've it's, seen it. You have. Have you? <laughs> yeah. is, it as, is it as atrocious as it sounds? Am I going to love it? <laughs> I mean, it's it's like WWE, right? Uh, with the announcers and everything else. And uh, like famous monsters doing wrestling moves on each other. It looks good. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, I do it, love it oiled up men in Speedos. I'm, I'm not going to lie. Uh, <laughs> uh, 2011's uh, The Howling Reborn uh, adds a kind of Teen Wolf flavor to the series. You know, because we always need Teen Wolf in a Howling <laughs> series. <laughs> of course. I hope the uh, I, I hope he does some oops in it. Oh. <laughs> also, in 2011, the night shift, some kind of comedy made in Alabama with lots of zombies. Probably accidentally watched because there's a Stephen King book with the same title. And in 2011, the Twilight Sagas, Breaking mm -hmm. Wind. I mean, Breaking Dawn, <laughs> Part One. Very good. And that's all I'm going to say for that. And there's another Underworld in 2012. This one, Awakening. Uh, the 20, uh, also in 2012, the classic Oscar winning movie, <laughs> Strippers <laughs> versus Werewolves, uh, came out. And I know everybody's seen it. So we can, you know, no point talking about it. Just a classic. Strippers versus Werewolves. Yeah. <laughs> Dark Shadows in 2012 was Tim Burton's take on the classic television show. I liked this movie. I thought it was fantastic. I thought it was really well done and paid a great homage to the original series. 
I thought it was very well done and was not a good homage to the original series and did not capture any of the feel of the original series, which I'm an absolute diehard fan of and did not like it. Sorry, Tim Burton. I like most of your movies. That's amazing. We both love the original series and have different takes on this movie. It's fantastic. I love it. Uh, In 2012, we have Game of Werewolves. This is a Spanish werewolf comedy that actually looks pretty good. And Werewolf Beast Among Us in 2012. Uh, this one looks exactly like Ginger Snaps Back. As we, I talked about, Ginger Snaps Back is the one that takes place in the 1800s. But this one looks like it doesn't have the charm. And most importantly, no Catherine Isabel. Yeah, of course. We have Love Bite in 2012. Raunchy British teen comedy with a werewolf girl. And then I'm also just going to say the Twilight Saga Breaking Dawn Part 2 so we can get that one over with and move <laughs> right along. I that was appreciate brave of that you. more than you know. <laughs> Where from 2013 about a French defense attorney who discovers his client is a werewolf. This was actually a really good film. It's not your typical classic werewolf movie at all. And it is very different. And I think that's part of what got it. It's cult following. Well, at least I'd consider it a cult classic anyway. Nice. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, Late phases in 2014. This one also looks really great. I've got it on my list. I want to watch it. It's about a blind Vietnam veteran fighting werewolves. This is really good. You should definitely watch it. Last phase? Phases? Yep. Okay, cool. Mm-hmm. It's on the list. It's, it's got the guy from Stakeland, if you've ever seen that. The vampire movie It's Canadian. Oh, too. yeah. Yeah. It's it's the main guy from that is the blind vet. Now, this next one looks up your alley there, Mark. Is, are you a big fan? <laughs> Okay, uh, and I have a list of some crazy werewolf movies uh, that are all on this list too. But we have uh, a movie which I was looking forward to a lot, uh, which was Wolf Cop. Um, but for whatever reason, I didn't really like it. Well, no. I, know, I know why you didn't like it, Mark. It's because you have no taste. This movie's fantastic. <laughs> it's hysterical. It, 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 it just didn't deliver on its promise. I, I totally He disagree. was a wolf and he was a cop. Exactly. Well, uh, what more do you want? <laughs> but the promise of like the B movie cheesiness, I mean, it just didn't work for me for whatever reason. And how I, well, how about Bubba the Redneck Werewolf, which was released the same year? I was going to say, I think that's a that's another one that I really enjoyed. I thought it was a a fun, campy film. I love both of these movies. We had Goosebumps in 2015, which if you grew up reading the books, I'm sure you were excited about. I, I liked this film a lot, and the werewolf in it is great. As somebody who has my never, kids, so good. Loved it. As someone who has never read a Goosebumps book in his life, I did like the movie. It's funny. Yeah. I didn't really read them growing up, but then with my, I read them to my kids. So uh, right. they're still much beloved. I totally but, read like every single one of them when I was like what i don't know 10 whenever you were supposed to yeah (laughs) and i think that's what it is i i grew up they they came out in the 90s if i'm not mistaken and i was was already a teenager by then yeah yeah uh 2015 brought us female werewolf a weird art film if you like strange slow artsy stuff that's a little sexy too you might like this how 2015 werewolves on a train there's werewolves on the motherfucking train (laughs) This, this, this is a really good british movie is it? Yep. It's I've seen the cover art. I've seen the cover art, but I don't. I don't think I've ever read and watched it. Yeah, it, it's really good. Um, you know, you've got the claustrophobic uh, kind of like you know, train to Busan, but with werewolves. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so yeah, definitely worth checking out. Um, in 2015, we have Freaks of Nature. Um, it's another teen comedy, so James probably watched it 20 times <laughs> um, at least. Yeah, it's in. The, it's set in the town of Dillard. Humans and vampires and zombies are all living in peace until the freaking aliens show up. So and I, now, now they have to work together. I'm going to be honest with you. I did try to watch this movie and I did not enjoy it. I did not get through it. Was it a little scary for you? Yeah, a little bit. It's a little <laughs> brutal for me, Mark. Yeah, that's <laughs> Underworld Blood Wars in 2016. Enough said. <laughs> We have Good Manners in 2017, a Portuguese film about a woman pregnant with a werewolf. This one apparently won a ton of awards and has incredible reviews. Um, I'm going to add this to my list. I have not seen it. 
It looks amazing. That one sounds awesome. 2017 also brought us another Wolf Cop. This one was not as good as the first. It does lose <laughs> all of its charm. It is garbage. That's too bad. Valley of the Shadows in 2017. Um, this is a Norwegian film. It's described as Scandinavian Gothic. And uh, as you werewolf fans probably know, Scandinavia has got a long history of werewolf uh, mythos. And I didn't watch it, but I watched the previews and it really looks incredible. I mean, it looks like Let the Right One In, but with werewolves. I mean, it's like this little little blonde headed kid. And, you know, it's in Nor- Norway with the snow and everything. It's it's on my list. This next one looks like the, up your alley, Mark. So again, this is about like the the uh, flashes of the Rob Zombie Nazi werewolves. It's uh, Werewolves of the Third Reich. But I think this came out um, after the. It did. Yeah, it came, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, this one looks like Inglorious Bastards, but with werewolves. Um, it looks good, but people seem to hate it. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. But if you're itching uh, for some Nazi werewolves. There you that go. Should, that should it. do it. <laughs> we have Among the Shadows 2019. Lindsay Lohan stars in this complicated looking werewolves and vampires in European government spying on each other something movie. <laughs> Sounds cool. I might check it out. It, it, I, I got through 10 minutes of it. I just couldn't. Ooh. Ooh, I couldn't. Right. All right. So 2020 brings us the New Mutants which is the X-Men spinoff. And I have to say, I was so excited to, for this movie and it was such a letdown. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it's garbage. It was, again, another one stuck in development hell for like years and years. And then it was released and it's got Anna Taylor-Joy in it and um, what's her face from Game of Thrones. But yeah, it is just bad. Well, in 2020, uh, I am Lisa. And this one looks really, really good. And I put it on my list. It's about a cute, nerdy girl who owns a bookstore. So, yeah, they they got me fucking boom. <laughs> and she's bullied by a gang of girls, one of, whose, one of whose mom is the sheriff. And uh, this one appears to invent some uh, of its own new werewolf mythology. I'm going to give it a watch. If you want something that's get, that gets good reviews and it looks real arty, I am Lisa. Uh, the Wolf of Snow Hollow in 2020. So I watched this. It's really good. It's like kind of complicated. Uh, got a lot of good characterization behind the characters. It's, you know, it's, you know I, I don't think I would watch it again. It's not like like the staple of werewolf film lore, but it's a solid entry. And 2020, again, gave us Wolf Walkers. It's an animated film based on Celtic mythology. And it's supposed to be absolutely amazing. I'm going to put it on my list. I'm going to watch this with my daughter. I'm excited for it. It looks, I guess they made eight films based on Celtic mythology. These are uh, Irish filmmakers. Looks really good. Nice. Werewolves with Win is a comedy based on a video game, which I mean, to me, <laughs> to me, you lose me, but people seem to love this movie. So if you like werewolf comedies based on video games, check out Werewolves Within. So let me let me say this about that. I liked this movie a lot and had zero idea. I had no idea that it was based on a video game. I didn't know it was based on a video game either. And I yeah, I I usually don't like that, although I like right. The Last of Us a lot. Um, yeah. But well, yeah, yeah, The that's... Last of Us was me. <laughs> I, I, I think it's a telltale game, uh, like a, just a decision based game, which is based on a board game, I believe. I could be wrong. It, uh, Matt, you should give it a, you should give it a shot. All right, I will. And then 2023 Black Mirror's new season had a an episode having to do with werewolves that I really particularly enjoyed. I thought it was kind of a a new take on a um unlike what being a werewolf was a metaphor for. So, I thought it was cool, definitely worth a watch. It reminded me of the South Park Britney Spears episode. You guys remember that? <laughs> I but don't it, know what you're referring to, and that sounds very disturbing. Well, it's because like this, the, like the um, with the paparazzi following you and photographing you, she gets photographed okay. to death. They're like ah. photographing her, ching 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 ching, and the flash bulbs, and she's like, and, that, and like it, it like literally kills her. Hmm. 
Interesting. <laughs> yeah, the Black Mirror episode. Well, I won't say too much about the Black Mirror episode because it's kind of part of the enjoyment of watching it is figuring out exactly what's happening. So I, I won't lie. I checked out of Black Mirror during season two. So I haven't wow, caught really? any of the new stuff. Yeah. Season oh. two. I mean, that's really early. That was I know because yeah. the first season was actually a British TV show. It wasn't even Netflix yet. And I absolutely love the first season. Mm. I like well, all of it. It's probably my favorite television show of all time. I, I probably yeah. should catch up. I just and I I don't even have a reason for not watching any of the seasons after season two. I just sort of gave up on it. I, I never just never went back to it. Oh, it's great. And um, it was originally devised by a guy that um, starred on a British TV comedy show, like sketch show called The Fast Show. So it's kind of weird that he went kind of dark. <laughs> Um, I also want to bring up uh, the Marvel um, Halloween special from a couple of years ago, Werewolf by Night. Oh. Which they are re-releasing this year in color. They shouldn't do that because the black and white works better. I think it, I, I absolutely agree. I think in color it's going to lose a lot of its charm. Yeah. I, I looked up a list of like ridiculous werewolf movie names. Let's hear it. Are these so actual come, movies or you made yeah, them up? No, no, these are actual movies. Why didn't you give it to me when I sent you the list, you <laughs> bastard? Because he probably did this three minutes because before I, we started I not, recording. I have not seen any of these because they're probably low budget, like absolute trash garbage. There was a bunch of Canadian made for TV movies and sci-fi made for the sci-fi channel movies. These, these, that these I took are probably, out. Yeah, these are probably below sci-fi level. <laughs> Mark, I've seen your taste in movies and the fact that you're saying you didn't watch them because they're low budget is ridiculous. <laughs> okay, so so let's just run through it. It's not going to take long. So we have Werewolf Santa. Oh, there's a like there's Santa a werewolf. Jaws. There's one coming out this year, this December. Oh, and I want to say that I beat everybody to the punch. Oh, I got a book. I wrote a story about a werewolf Santa, and it's on the, the cover of the book has a werewolf Santa on it. Well, you should sue them. I know. Well, <laughs> you don't even infringement. You don't need to get the book for my benefit. I remember seeing your cover. Yeah, Krista <laughs> wrote me an awesome fucking um, blurb for it. Uh, we have werewolf bitches from outer space. Oh, fuck yeah. Of course we do. Of course <laughs> we do. An erotic werewolf in London. <laughs> <laughs> might be a I think actually. I might have I might have come across that one. Uh, a Mexican werewolf in Texas. Oh, immigration. Mm -hmm. hot hot topic uh werewolf world there's lots of alliteration they just mm. like werewolf what else is w we can make something uh were werewolf massacre at hell's gate kind of cool like that's that. not, yeah that yeah if it we're just going based off titles i like that werewolf in a girl sorority <laughs> sounds Maybe like a, a cheesy eighty slasher Hmm. Yeah, I could do that. Well, that's from the like going back to that classic Italian flick. <laughs> it's, uh, speaking of sexy, uh, sexy teenage werewolf rampage four. I don't I didn't think know there was the, a first there three. Was a one to three. I, no. think this is <laughs> I feel like they should have a subtitle like anal massacre or something. Well, you would. Jesus Christ. I mean, it, it sounds like a porn. <laughs> it is. I, I feel like it is a porn. Yeah. I'm going to be a, it's it, a it porn. Could be. Uh, grandma <laughs> werewolf. Oh, I, I think mean, I've heard of that one. Yeah, yeah I'm I mean, also, I mean, I just, I instantly thought Little Red Riding Hood, so like, I which is awesome, something yeah. going on there, right? Uh, again, we're you know we're expanding the scope here. We're including everybody. Wheelchair werewolf. That's good. That's necessary. Yeah. Although it was a little uh, bit covered in Silver Bullet, but yeah, well, yeah, he wasn't a werewolf in it, but yeah, uh, werewolf babysitter. Um, you know, I'd hire. Her. <laughs> oh, assuming it's a... Okay, this is maybe the best title in movie history, and I'm glad I can see everyone sitting down because you might fall. We have a movie called Werewolf Ninja Philosopher. That's me. <laughs> that sounds amazing. That is you. <laughs> yeah. uh, I was a communist werewolf. Nice. Well, then you have more of that old Europe thing, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Vampire zombie werewolf. Whoa. Covering your Cover bases? I was just going to say the same thing. You got everything <laughs> all our bases covered. Uh, I'm going to make a sequel called Mummy Vampire Zombie Werewolf. Cool. Remember there was that that Mexican movie with Lon Chaney Jr. He was a mummy. 
that yeah. when he's reanimated with blood becomes a werewolf. Right. <laughs> I mean, that old trope. <laughs> uh, space werewolf. Hell yeah. You, got a, space, you, you, you have a space, space vampire in, in plan space. Nine, no one can you? hear you how. I beat you. Yeah, I was about <laughs> to say that. I'm like, I don't know if that's the tagline, but that's what they should have, should have made. I mean, I guess if the werewolf's in space, the moon's already out there. All the I was time. just going to say, but, you're, you're closer to the moon. Right. Yeah. It's always a full moon in space. They need to vet <laughs> their astronauts for this, man. This is, could be a problem. Hmm. Okay, and the last one is a wonderful uh, alliteration title. The Wimp Whose Woman Was a Werewolf. <laughs> Year did that come out? Oh. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's right. convoluted for sure. <laughs> and that's going to wrap it up for us today with our werewolves in movies. We hope that you've found some good ones out there. And happy spooky season halloween's coming up and we're just gonna keep right on with the werewolves werewolves and as always we want to hear from you what's your favorite werewolf movie did we like some you don't or don't like something that you do let us know you can drop us a line on any of our social media platforms or you can give us an email at Murder Coaster Podcast at gmail.com. That's Murder Coaster Podcast at gmail.com. And as I said before, if you know where I can see the film Werewolf at Woodstock, please send me a link or let me know. I'm dying to see this film. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed our special program on the history of the werewolf movie, and we will see you soon. Beware of the moon. Ow!